Any of you thinking about Christmas yet? Ha! Turns out I already bought a Christmas present or two. How about that? I want to let you know that we're going to have an opportunity as a church. Um, the Quechua Benefit Charity, that's the, the charity connected to the alpaca farm, the other side of Shoals. Um, we are working on um, having a joint venture with that charity of uh, selling Christmas trees at the alpaca farm. And that will raise money for the Quechua Benefit Charity for kids in Peru and, and for our church. So I think that could be a really wonderful opportunity. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, people in the Christmas tree business, they're already thinking about Christmas. And people who are really good at, um, you know, getting ahead of things, they might already be <clears throat> thinking about Christmas. I know it's a little early, but I want to invite you to think about what it was like for you leading up to Christmas as a kid. Somewhere at some age, <clears throat> there's a shift that takes place where you begin to look at Christmas differently as an adult or as, an apparent, as a parent. And I think you know when that shift takes place. Because you remember when you were a kid, you would count the days to Christmas, and it seemed like forever before Christmas would get there. The anticipation almost killed you. Do you remember that? After that switch takes place, Christmas comes way, way too fast. And it just comes upon you, and you don't feel ready. So we kind of look at things differently as an adult. But I want you to think of <clears throat> the anticipation that you had as a kid for Christmas coming. And why was that so powerful? Because we look forward to getting gifts. One of the things that was formative to my youth was Tonka. I loved Tonka trucks. In fact, if you look at that picture closely enough, you see in the bed of that dump truck, they're rivets. And that means that bad boy is made of metal. And that's a great truck, you know, to be leaning on and pushing around and filling with dirt and, and doing boy stuff. If that doesn't trip your trigger, <clears throat> maybe this. Girls love dolls. If you, well, with our kids anyway, <clears throat> if we gave um, Sam some of Stephanie's toys to play with, they became um, crash derby kind of items, whether they were Barbies or whatever they were. And if we gave Stephanie any of Sam's toys or cars or something, they all had names and relationships before it was done, uh, right? Um, but we grow up and we don't uh, kind of give up our desire for toys and we find all kinds of different uh, things that we might be interested in. It might be an automobile. Um, I, I was in Sherwood and I saw someone drive up in, you guessed it, a 1978 280Z. And that was my first car. And I stopped and I said, is that a 78? And the lady said, yeah. I said, that's an awesome car. I used to have one of those. That's awesome. And we drove off and that was it, right? Um, wow. I think I, I, in my life, I might try to have another one of those one of these days. Um, pretty, pretty fun. But we get camp trailers, and we get China and China hutches, and we get furniture, and we get houses, and we get all kinds of things that, that make us excited. And think this, um, when you're about to buy something like that, how do you feel? Oh, it's almost like that little kid Christmas time again. Now our toys are too big to sleep with, right? Maybe we sleep in our toys sometimes. But when we are going to buy something, uh, we can get pretty excited about that. But do you ever have buyer's remorse? When I buy something big, I usually have buyer's remorse. And it's usually not very rational. It's just, oh, man, I just bought something really big. I spent a lot of money or I made a big commitment or something like that. Um, uh, buyer's remorse is, is kind of hard too, isn't it? So, you know, our, our things, we get excited about things, and then we get unexcited about things, but one of the things that we probably experience is that when we get excited about buying whatever it is that we're going to buy, we don't stay that excited for all that long, do we? 
inevitably, when we get some, we still might enjoy them and we still might like them, but somehow the excitement kind of wears off after we've had that thing for a while. And sometimes we kind of get really tired of it and we want to get rid of it. Sometimes our toys are small an iPhone some picture where somebody in the family had an iPhone and somebody in the family had an iPad and dad said, yeah, and I paid. (laughs) I should give Stephanie credit. I got that from her. Um, But sometimes we get really excited about our technologies. And I want to tell you that technology companies actually hire psychologists so that their products and that their apps are are designed psychologically to be as addictive as possible because they make money according to how much time you spend on their product, right? So just know that, that they're deliberately making these things as addictive as possible. Um, And so we we wrap ourselves up in these things and um, we're really excited about those things. You know, you can't buy a new iPhone without being pretty excited about it until you try to download all of your stuff and then you start hitting yourself in the head because it's taken so long and doesn't work that well, right? But you get excited about technology and you can get really, really into technology. You, you can get hooked on technology. You can get addicted to technology. And, and some people need an intervention. Can I hear an amen to that? Some people need an intervention. They're so addicted to their technology. Not any young people, but, but sometimes people get so addicted to that that, that you know, they need to back off of that a bit. Now, here's a guy that seems like he has it made. Um, If you look on the license plate on this car, it says Alex Thorne, chief play officer. I have a feeling he might really work for Toys R Us. Doesn't that look like a dream situation? Here he has all of this stuff. And it's just amazing. So if you walked up to that and someone said, all of that is yours. Wow. Be like a dream come true. Well, not for us adults because the car is too small. But, you know, if you were a kid and somebody said, all of that's yours. Wow. Jackpot. Well, looking at the parables of Jesus, I want us to look at a couple of small parables this morning. I'm kind of trying to look at the agricultural parables of Jesus and uh, this first parable mentions a field, so it qualifies. All right, so take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 13. We'll look at these two parables. Short parables, three verses for two parables. You start studying the parables of Jesus and you think, wow, this is going to be exciting. It is exciting. You think this is going to be great. Maybe maybe it won't be too hard. Maybe it won't be um, too exegetical or too theological. And you you get into it and you realize, wow, these parables make you think. And I would encourage you to think about these two parables, these three verses, uh, this week. And what do they tell you? I mean, I can't believe how much is really packed in to these three verses in these parables. And it's just blown my mind thinking about this stuff. So Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like, that's a parable, comparing, and comparing the kingdom of God, comparing the kingdom of heaven, comparing spiritual things to the physical world. The people would, would have had great experience and understanding of the physical world that Jesus is talking about, and Jesus is trying to tap into that understanding to explain something that's much less obvious and, and much harder to understand, which is the spiritual world. And to say the spiritual world, we mean the kingdom of God, um, the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. Treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field kingdom of heaven. Now, the, the, the basic message of that parable seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? The, the kingdom of heaven 
is really valuable, really exciting. It's a treasure. And a guy finds it, and he goes and he sells everything so he can buy the field, because the field is where the treasure is. And he gets the field so he has the treasure. So the kingdom of heaven is so important that it's worth this guy going selling everything that he has to buy this dusty old field because that field is actually where the treasure is. The, the basic point of the parable is pretty clear, isn't it? But then this other parable comes, <clears throat> and you start thinking, okay, that parable is somewhat clear too, but then you start comparing the two parables. So again, he says, another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant sinking, seeking fine pearls. Or you could say a businessman. The kingdom of heaven is like a businessman seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, now that's a pretty awesome pearl. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. Bought that one. He sold everything he had to buy that one pearl. That one pearl was so amazing. That's what the kingdom of God is like. So let's, let's begin with a takeaway. God's kingdom offers the fulfillment of a lifetime. Now Jesus says this, and I believe it's true. But that doesn't mean that I'm that excited about the kingdom of God doesn't mean that you're that excited about the kingdom of God. So I have to ask myself the question, what's the matter with me? <laughs> what's the matter with me that I might not be so excited about the kingdom of God? What is it that I don't understand about the kingdom of God? What is it that I don't see about the kingdom of God? Do I see the kingdom of God? By the way, where do you see the most powerful example of the kingdom of God on earth today? Where do you see the most important example of the kingdom of God on earth today. The church. This is the kingdom of God. Right here. So God's kingdom offers fulfillment of a lifetime. So wouldn't it be awesome if our life experience matched these two parables? Because we'd be pretty excited. And we'd get fulfillment. Because I have a suspicion that when you buy into the kingdom of God, there's not the potential for the buyer's remorse. And when you buy into the kingdom of God, there's not the potential for getting tired of what you have. There's, there's not the potential, Jesus says, um, where your treasure is, there where your, your heart is also. And so invest in heaven where moth and rust doesn't corrupt. If you love your car, I like my truck. I want to I wanna put on my truck, it's a Jeep thing. I don't know. <laughs> Some people have Jeeps. Um, I want you to know that it's out in the parking lot rusting and deteriorating as we speak. Sad thought. But when you've bought into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God doesn't rust and deteriorate. So you start thinking about these two parables, and you think, okay, one's a treasure that he finds accidentally. The second is a pearl that the businessman deliberately goes out and seeks. And you think, well, okay, that seems like a deliberate difference. Why, why is there that difference? And the thing that really blows me away that I don't think I've figured out yet is that as soon as they find I mean, I understand, you know, the way life works. As soon as they find the treasure or as soon as they find the pearl, they leave it. They have to go away and sell everything that they have. And that's got to be a vulnerable moment, isn't it? What if someone slips in and buys the pearl while he's going and selling everything he has? What if somebody slips in and finds the treasure in the field while he's going and selling 
everything he has. I, I don't really understand if that's a huge significance or, or what it is, but it might be that that's a vulnerable place. And I wonder if, if a lot of us don't ever get out of our vulnerable place because we leave it and we go and, and we get so stuck on selling everything that we have that we never get back to, okay, now I'm, I'm full in, I'm buying into this, right? But these two guys, they left, they sold everything, and they come back and the, and, the, and the field and the treasure is still there and he buys it and the pearl is still there and he buys it, right? You ever, you ever think, oh, I gotta, this is on sale and I need to buy it and there's only a couple left and I gotta think about this and you ever feel that pressure? Of what if I decide to buy this and it's not there anymore? And if that happens to you, you just go, oh, disappointment. Right? Um, so that's, that's a difference in these two parables. Um, it's interesting that, that one is doing something else. I don't know, maybe he's working in the field, whatever he's doing, working, he doesn't own the field, maybe he's working for the farmer uh, or whatever, and he happens to find this treasure. He's not seeking the treasure, but all of a sudden, boom, there's this treasure. And he's excited about it. With the pearl, here's a businessman, and he's seeking the, the pearls. And he's, he's in the business of trying to find the best pearls that he can, and finally he runs across this awesome pearl of a lifetime. I don't know if that means that sometimes we're not really looking for spiritual things, and God just whacks us, and all of a sudden we see the kingdom of God, and we, we get it, and we understand. I mean, our life is not in pursuit of spiritual things. But God grabs a hold of us. And maybe sometimes our life is in pursuit of spiritual things. And, and we grow to the point where all of a sudden, you know, we get it and we find that pearl of great price. I mean, do you have enough to think about this week when you look at these parables? Um, so some common elements of these parables, <clears throat> both guys find something of highest value. Both leave and sell everything. I mean, right away they know. Whatever I have, I'm getting rid of it and getting the money and going back and I'm buying this thing. And both invest everything that they have for this thing that they found. And both end up, in the metaphor, totally buying into God's kingdom. There's no reserve. There's no holding back. And the reason is, and these guys, these guys are making a sacrifice because they're selling everything, but for them, the sacrifice is way worth it because what they're going to get is so much greater than the sacrifice. So it's a sacrifice, but really it's not a sacrifice because the payback and the reward is so much greater. And then the contrasting elements. Well, the treasure is hidden. The pearl is advertised. You got a businessman. I don't know. Is he going on eBay? Did he go on Amazon? Is he searching the internet? Is he going to yard sales, flea markets? I don't know. I mean, they didn't have it. They didn't have eBay back in that day. Um, but what was he doing as a businessman? Whatever they would do in that day, he was trying. He was searching. He was going to the places where they sold things like this. And they didn't have artificial pearls. This was the real thing. He was looking for something advertised while the treasure was hidden. Um, the treasure came as unexpected. It was a surprise. The pearl was sought after. Do people find the kingdom of God in different ways, I wonder? The focus in the first is on things, the treasure. The focus on the second is on actions. Here's a businessman seeking pearl. And maybe the first uh, emphasizes the work of God because the treasure just got put there and he kind of stumbled on it. And maybe the second emphasizes our part. And it's significant that the work of God comes first. But without our effort, we can't even be saved without doing some things. We're not saved by our own works, but if you don't stop and listen and take account and believe, you can't be saved. So you can't be 100% passive and even be saved. And certainly you can't be 100% passive 
or even very passive and interact and connect in the kingdom of God. You can work as hard as you want, and if God isn't working, what's going to happen? Nada. Zero. But if God is working and you're resisting, now what's going to happen? So in the first parable, I think maybe um, it emphasizes God's work. In the second parable, maybe it emphasizes our work. But in any case, I know this. God's kingdom offers the fulfillment of a lifetime. So here's point one. God's kingdom is a treasure worth preserving. God's kingdom is a treasure worth preserving. Here he is. Kingdom of heaven is like a, and this is kind of all one thing. The, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. And I think, okay, a field, that's a normal thing. That's an everyday life kind of thing, a material thing. And it makes me think, you know, in this physical life that we live, in this material world in which we interact, on another dimension, there are spiritual things. Maybe hidden in this material life is a whole other dimension of God's kingdom. And we can find the kingdom of God because remember, um, God created material things even in the very beginning. The heavens are declaring the glory of God, Psalm 19. Remember, God created material things as a reflection of spiritual realities. So maybe at some point in this material world, as we gain wisdom in this material world, all of a sudden we recognize, hey, I see the kingdom of God in this stuff. What a great thing if we can recognize, I'm going to work. And maybe I'm on the phone a lot, maybe I'm on the computer a lot, Maybe I'm interacting with people a lot. Maybe I'm dealing with machines. Maybe I'm building things. Maybe I'm cutting things. Maybe I'm putting things together. Maybe I'm fixing things. Maybe I'm whatever I'm doing in this material world. What an awesome thing if we can begin to realize that hidden in that is the kingdom of God. Hidden in my need to go and earn a living. Hidden in my responsibility to get the kids to school. Hidden in my helping my kids with homework. Hidden in me spoiling my grandkids is the kingdom of God. Because I realize what I'm doing has a greater significance than just those things. Because I'm bringing the presence of Christ into all of those things that I'm involved with. What a moment when we find the kingdom of God hidden in our existence in the material world. And in the parable, it seems like he finds, you know, there's this one treasure, this one time big, you know, kingdom of God thing hits him. And I guess once you come to that realization, you know, there's, you, you, your perspective changes. But maybe there's a, a constant and continual realization that, hey, I saw the kingdom of God in this thing like never before. I'm going to help coach a kid's sports team. Well, what is that? Coaching a kid's sports team. Oh, or do you see the kingdom of God in that activity? So the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found, and he found it, and he made sure it was hidden. Don't want somebody taking this from me. And from, get this, joy over it. Boy, get that. He is so driven by the joy of finding the kingdom of God. He goes and disentangles himself with everything else. He goes and sells everything that he has. And he invests it in that field because that field gives him the right to that treasure. God's kingdom on earth 
maybe it takes time to see. Maybe you have to have a little bit of maturity to see it, and maybe you have to take time to see it. Maybe you have to slow down and think and take time to actually see the kingdom of God. God's kingdom on earth is a joy to find. So if you're actually finding the kingdom of God, then that's a a joyful moment. Um, Paul says, I I think I can see um, so much of Paul's teaching and theology coming out of the teaching of Jesus. Um, Paul quotes Isaiah, and he says, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. God has for us better than we can imagine, better than we've even thought of. And if we know that, and we find the kingdom of God, we'll know that this is going to be better than I can imagine. And finally, God's kingdom on earth consumes us with an eternal purpose. We don't need to go through life with a shallow purpose or no purpose. We can go through life with a deep and eternal purpose. Here's Paul again. And Paul uses this word treasure. He uses it in a a little bit different way. But I think it, it fits what Jesus is saying. Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. But this time the treasure is not in a field. This time the treasure is in the earthen vessel of our physical life. You know, we, we have this, this fleshy body that we live in, right? And Paul says, in this mortal existence, we have this treasure. So whether Gail is, is struggling um, and unable to interact like she used to interact, she still has this treasure. So no, no, matter, no matter what condition we're in, no matter, no matter what condition our life is in, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, our, our earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Uh, we're weak, just so we don't get confused, and those who see us don't get confused. We're weak, so everybody knows it's God who is strong. Amen? We don't like our weakness, but that's why we're weak. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. You might want to write the reference to this down. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. That the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. So even though this body hasn't participated in a resurrection yet, it houses a soul and a spirit that is attuned to resurrection life and experiences and can experience resurrection life. That's the treasure, the resurrection, the kingdom of God. And we carry that around. And even though we have all kinds of physical afflictions from inside and outside, that doesn't change the fact that we have this treasure, which is the glory of God, the kingdom of God, the gospel, resurrection life. So point one, God's kingdom is a treasure worth preserving. Point two, God's kingdom is a task worth pursuing. God's kingdom is a treasure. God's kingdom is a task. So again, the kingdom of heaven is like a businessman seeking fine pearls altogether. The kingdom of heaven is like a businessman seeking fine pearls. He's doing business. He's motivated He's motivated to make money. He's motivated to find the greatest pearl that he possibly can. And upon finding one pearl of great value, the pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. God's kingdom on earth takes work to recognize. If you're passive and you're not going to put any effort into it, you're probably not going to see the kingdom of God. If you're not going to try... The kingdom of God is probably going to whiz right past you. God's kingdom on earth is the best work among many options. 
This man found a lot of pearls, and he bought and sold a lot of pearls. But when he found that one pearl, he knew that was the best pearl. The best pearl ever. And God's kingdom on earth is an infinitely good investment. You want a good investment of your life? You might be a school teacher. You might be a carpenter. You might be a computer engineer. You might be a policeman. But if you want to be, if you want a, a great investment of your life in those areas, make those things more than that. Bring Christ into those things. As a dad and a mom and a grandparent, bring Christ into your family. And now it's not just about, I built this, I fixed this. It's, I was a reflection of God, the kingdom of God. I brought the gospel. I brought the treasure. You've heard the story of the rich young ruler. Jim brought that up before church, actually. Um, And he said, a lot of people misunderstand that. And I agree with him. A lot of people misunderstand that story. Now I want you to get the impression that I think, for you to be a good Christian, you can't own anything. For you to be a good Christian, you've got to go sell your stuff. That's that's, that's not, not the point. Um, so let's, let's read this from Mark 10. And he was setting out on a journey. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him. So l- look at the, the intensity and the excitement of this guy running up to Jesus. A man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He sees an opportunity in front of him. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? This is so important to this story. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Got to get that one down. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. I mean, these are real requirements from God. And they're good requirements from God. And, and they're right and they're holy. They're healthy, right? All of these 613 laws of the Mosaic Covenant, if you want to count them, right? Um, They're not pretend. They're the real thing. But the number one thing that people are supposed to get from those laws, you know, they're good to live up to, but the number one thing people are supposed to get from those laws is, I can't do it. And usually people thought, I'm good at this. This guy, right? Translate that to Christianity. right? The requirements of Christianity, they're all good, right requirements. The number one thing we need to get is we can't do it. And we run around thinking like, man, I'm great because I'm doing it. And to the extent that we do it, it's only by the power of God, right? But the biggest point of the law, Paul says in Galatians, it's a tutor to lead us to Christ. The biggest point of the law is you can't keep the law because you're sinful. You can't do this Christian thing, not perfectly, because you're sinful. Remember, Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good but God. That's probably the main point of the Bible, (laughs) right? That the only one who's really good is God. And, and God can save us and transform us and make us righteous in Christ and, and make us good, but that's a work of God. Yeah, we can't resist it. We've got to cooperate. We've we got to seek the pearl. We've got to do something when we find the treasure. But there's only one that's good, and that's God. And so he said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. Look at me. I've completely, perfectly followed the law. Can that be true? Okay, I know he was once a teenager. So he couldn't have perfectly honored his father and his mother. Do I hear an amen? Okay. But for him, it's like, hey, I, I'm there, man. I'm your example. I did all of these things. This is interesting. Jesus, looking at him, felt a love for him. I mean, he he wanted to be a good Jewish person. He wanted to serve God. 
He just was a little too full of himself. Jesus loved him. And because Jesus loved him, he said to him, one thing you lack. I mean, Jesus cut to the heart of it for him. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, here's where people make the mistake. They think that Jesus is sending out a general principle that if you're going to follow Christ, you have to not have anything. Now, this was specific to this person in this situation. Here this person person asks, how can I inherit eternal life? And I kind of think he wanted Jesus to say, you got it, dude, you're awesome. Maybe he was fishing for that when he was talking to Jesus. But Jesus says, you know, only one person's good. So here this man has a heart on a certain level for spiritual things. And he's committed to it because he's worked really hard to keep the law. But he's wealthy. And he's full of himself. And the kingdom of God stands right in front of him. The king. The kingdom of God. Get this. The kingdom of God was present for that man in a way that it almost never is. The kingdom of God is present for us in a powerful way, but in a different way. We don't have the king physically standing in front of us. The king who is all about his kingdom work right there and then. Here's an opportunity. You might call this insider trading. (laughs) He's got some inside information, and Jesus says, if you make this trade, you're really going to become wealthy. Because here you got the king standing right in front of you, and you have an opportunity to, to disengage with all of this stuff that you have. Remember what the Old Covenant said? If you obey me, God said, I will bless you materially. And and this guy was blessed to the highest degree. And he's thinking, it's because I obey God. It's probably not exactly wrong in that. And yet he thought it was him. He thought when God blessed him that it was him, not God. Isn't that something? Because he was so good. So Jesus says, you've got an opportunity right now to, to disengage with this stuff that is all temporal and come and literally, physically, in my presence, be a part of my kingdom work. One thing you lack. Go sell everything, give it to the poor, disengage with it, and come follow me. Most of us are not in that, none of us are really in that exact place of the rich young ruler. And probably most of us are not in the place where the one thing we lack is to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow Jesus. Well, what we need to do probably is follow Jesus with the stuff we have. And if we have stuff that won't, help us follow Jesus and won't contribute to our following Jesus, that's probably the stuff we need to get rid of. But we probably have stuff that helps us follow Jesus. So we use it for that. But look at this, verse 22, the last verse. But at these words, his face fell. Because remember, I think he wanted Jesus to say, dude, you are an example. If everybody could be like you, God would bless them like you, and everything would be great. Jesus said, Take the most important thing to you and get rid of it and make me the most important thing to you. And his face fell and he went away grieved for he was one who owned much property. Huh. So he found a treasure in a field, ran up to Jesus, Or maybe he'd been seeking that pearl of great value, and he found that in Jesus. But when it came time for him to go away and sell everything and buy into that, he chose not to. And he was grieved. 
And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. We're all pretty much wealthy, by the way. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, however you want to interpret that. It just means that if you're rich, it's harder for you to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because if you're rich, all these material things are pretty nice. And they were even more astonished and said to him, because remember, the rich people in Israel were the people who were blessed by God. So this is astonishing, isn't it? If you're really blessed by God and you're really wealthy, it's hard for you to get into the kingdom of God. Wait, I thought this was the kingdom of God blessing. How often does the blessing of God draw us away from God? Isn't that the most ironic thing ever? How often do we take credit for the blessing of God? It's, it's the most amazing thing when the blessing of God makes us arrogant. Look at me, I can dunk a basketball. How far does God have to reach down to dunk a basketball? Look how amazing I am, I am so smart. God blesses us, and we take credit for it. We get arrogant, and we move away from God. That's amazing, isn't it? I want the blessing of God to draw me to God. And I think that'll motivate God to bless me. I think that's probably worked out in my life. I don't know. I mean, I do the same as everybody else, but maybe once in a while, I, I let the, the blessing of God draw me to God, and I'm grateful. And I think if I can be grateful to God for his blessing, maybe I'll get more blessing. Do I hear an amen? Let's try that strategy. So these disciples are astonished, and they say to him, then who can be saved? And looking upon them, Jesus said, with men it is impossible. So true. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. So God can even save rich people. Do I hear an amen? We're grateful, because in, in uh, all the world and in world history, man, we're living like royalty, aren't we? Who are all really rich. Maybe we don't think so. But isn't it great that with God all things are possible? Because God saved us. And, and God can turn our attention from all of the distractions. And God can give us the heart, not like the rich young ruler, but like the guys who found the treasure in the pearl. To have the attitude that I'll, I'll give up whatever it takes to engage with the kingdom of God. So I'm going to think this guy has just gathered up everything he has and he's ready to sell it for the sake of Christ. Well, I don't know. Wouldn't that be awesome? So God's kingdom offers the fulfillment of a lifetime. So let's, let's consider our own life. Some really interesting questions. Whose kingdom are we building? I think it's pretty easy for me to build my kingdom. You know, you can be a pastor and be doing church work and still be building your own kingdom. Let alone other stuff. But whose kingdom am I building? Whose kingdom are you building? <sighs> Secondly, are we spending or investing our life? I hope you meditate on that question because I think that's a really powerful question. Because I can go through my life just spending it. Spending it on stuff for me, on experiences for me. Expend, spend it on building my own kingdom. Spend it on fun. Spend it on entertainment. But, you know, we are really sucked into entertainment anymore as Americans, aren't we? I mean, we are an entertainment culture. Am I spending my life or am I investing my life? And it doesn't mean that I'm not engaged in things that make me happy. It doesn't mean I never have fun. But am I living my life generally with a larger purpose, a kingdom purpose? I'm going to go to work, or I'm going to be at home doing things I'm responsible for every week. I'm going to be doing most of the same things. But is there a higher purpose for these things? Is there a higher reason for these things? Am I working as unto the Lord, 
not just as a man pleaser? Am I working in my job and at home and with my family to please the Lord or just to please the people around me or myself? So I can live my life and really almost do, do the same things, but do it with an attitude and intention that makes it an investment. Wouldn't you rather make your life an investment? Because if you just spend your life at the end of your life, what do you have? Well, I live my life. If you invest at the end of your life, you lived your life. but you have all of this treasure. And just because we lived with a different heart, what do we buy into? And we're, it's constant we're trying to be sold a bill of goods all the time, right? Strangest thing happened to me. I put on my list of things to get for camping glow sticks, This morning, and this morning I got a news feed, and one of the things that the news feed, a news feed, and you know what was in one of the things in the news feed? Glow sticks. How often do you see glow sticks in a news feed? Seriously? Get this, <laughs> this is scaring me. I put that in the notes on my phone. Somebody's watching. Now, was that coincidence? I don't know. Let's see how many times we see glow sticks in a news feed in the future. Just understand, you're the product. You're what they're selling. They're selling you to people selling stuff. So what do we really buy into? We're being so manipulated, probably. It's just unbelievable. Consider God's kingdom. The real kingdom of God is easy to miss. You know, Jesus is supposed to be easy and encouraging and fluffy, right? And Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of God is hard to get into. Jesus said that? Yeah. The value of the real kingdom of God is compelling, offering deep joy and eternal purpose. The real kingdom of God requires our all, all we have and all we do. The real kingdom of God on earth is like heaven on earth. <clears throat> Indoor skydiving. <laughs> I think we have one of those nearby. It's not the real thing. You've probably really skydived. A couple times. <laughs> I bet it's not quite the same. But what I love is the expression on this guy's face. <laughs> I can't tell if he's smiling or, or what. But that, that's a lot of wind right there. Um, yeah, entertainment. Did you know they have um, adult arcades now where they sell alcohol? I mean, there's got to be nothing more fun than playing video games and drinking beer. <laughs> right? Just let me tell you, that is spending your life. It's not investing it. Right? And if that's not good enough for you, you can go to one of the many casinos around us have you, I don't know, man. I mean, it's worth going into these casinos and just looking at the slot machines these days. I mean, it's like a mini-series sitcom cartoon in front of you. It's crazy. I mean, you can choose Flintstones, all kinds of stuff, and it's a story, and it just, it just brings you into it. I've not played one of them, right? <clears throat> but you see people sitting there, and, man, they're just putting their stuff in there. And I just want to let you know, um, mathematically, um, you can't win if you keep playing. The only way you can win is accidentally win something and stop, right? But then when you win, you won't stop because you go, look at you, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm going to do this, right? And, but just, you know, if you see 96% payoff on slot machines, what does that mean? That if you play long enough, because if on average, you're going to get 96% of what you put in there. Sounds pretty great, right? I'm looking for the 105% payoff. I'll stay there all day and play that one. Right? But if you stay there long enough and keep getting 96% back on average of what you put in there, what are you going to have when you're done? Guaranteed, if you stay long enough, you will have zero. 
And then you look around you and say, how do they pay for these slot machines? These are fancy. And you walk in the casino and you say, how do they pay for this casino? This is a fancy casino. This looks really expensive. Right? So just know how they paid for that when you walk into the casino. Right? Um, though we want to give ourselves all these things that make us feel great and we can be manipulated. Um, but in fact, um, <laughs> the kingdom of God may not seem as glitzy, but it does offer the fulfillment of a lifetime. The real kingdom of God on earth is like heaven on earth. What's that like? That's like finding a treasure hidden in the field. That's like a businessman seeking fine pearls. Let's pray.